And then we would like to focus on, after that, the operation of prayer, which brings the divine love into the soul. Uh, what we find often is that most people we talk to about divine love um, and about the operation of prayer and faith still struggle with developing within themselves a, a passionate desire to pray. And, and that seems to be the biggest problem. The biggest problem that most people face is having a passionate desire to connect with God and to pray and to receive that love. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of the time we don't have such a sincere desire to receive divine love. And that's probably our major issue. Now, what we'd like to do is talk to you about why it's our major issue and what, what, what we need to understand about divine love and the operation upon the soul that will help you see its importance in terms, of, in terms of your own development. And that it's a gift, that it's an exciting, wonderful, gift-giving adventure rather than a thing I've got to do. A chore. <laughs> a chore. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So let's talk about the divine love. And what it actually does to you. Now, we've mentioned this to you many times, but we feel at times that it's difficult for people to understand the actual physical effects that divine love has upon the person themselves, their own soul, and what's going on within their soul. Now, imagine this is your soul, and probably what I should do to be more accurate, where is the eraser there? Is. there. Um, is to draw the half of the soul, because you are actually one half of one. So let's say, let's draw it like that, shall we? Let's say you're the male or the female half of one. So you remember you've got your two bodies. The physical body and the spirit body. And then this is your soul. So if you're the female half of the soul, you're possibly wearing a dress, but that's how I'll draw you. Okay, so there's, a, let's say, a representation of your soul, which you've seen plenty of times from me before. Now, this soul was created with initially only one potentiality. And the potentiality of its creation is that it can never become better than what it actually is. It can grow in the sense of knowledge and experience. It can use its will in harmony or out of harmony with love. But in the end, it can never be bigger than the perfect natural human. It will always get to that point sooner or later. Now, the entire, so now I'm talking about the entire soul, but, but let's assume, because I'm speaking to you as an individual, that's your half of the soul, or your half of the soul, depending on whether you're masculine or feminine. Of course, these two splits could be male, male, female, female. So we're not too fussed about how the soul splits in this case. We're just saying that your half of the soul has only the capacity to reach its perfected state, which, which we call the perfect natural human, whether that's a male or a female. Does that make sense? Now, the perfect natural human is, is a state that any person who develops their soul can reach in, in, their future time, in their future. And there are literally billions of people who have reached that condition in the spirit world after they've passed from the earth. And that condition is equivalent to, as we've told you before, the sixth sphere or the sixth dimension of the spirit world. In other words, you cannot progress any further than that dimension um, if you only develop yourself as the perfect natural human. And also your development will be very much based around what you choose to do. You have to choose with your will what you're going to do, whether you're going to become more refined in love or not. And the more refined in the way in which you use your love, the more you approach this condition of your first creation, which is the condition of the perfect natural man. Now, that is available to all of us at any time, this progression. Every single person on earth, whether they're aware of it or not, is progressing towards the perfect natural man. 
Sooner or later, they will reach that condition. For many of them, it's thousands of years later in the spirit world where they reach that condition. For many of them, it can be hundreds of years or you can even progress to that condition in 20 or 30 or 50 years in the spirit world. It's quite easy to do that. On earth, it's a bit harder because there's all these external influences causing you to break the conditions of the perfect natural man. Now, the perfect natural man is very focused on ethics. In other words, we need to become ethically pure, ethically in harmony with God's viewpoint of ethics in order to become the perfect natural man. We don't have to believe in God. We don't have to have a relationship with God. Many of the people who become the perfect natural human do believe in God, but don't have a relationship with God. So they have a concept of God that's a human concept or a revised human concept of God, but they don't actually have a personal relationship with God. But they still have become ethically pure, morally pure. There's development in moral, morals as well. And you could say this is the development in natural love. And natural love is the love that comes from within the soul itself, the human soul, that is projected outwards towards anything in its environment. So we become perfect in natural love. So that's, that's how we were created. We were created to have that capacity. None of us can grow beyond that capacity by ourselves, through our own effort. It's impossible, in fact, to grow beyond that capacity through your own effort. It is possible for you to get to the perfect natural human through your own effort, but it's impossible to grow beyond that point through your own effort, physically and spiritually and emotionally impossible. And it's impossible for the soul to grow beyond that point through its own effort. So that being said, we've introduced to you, historically, in the different times that we've presented things to you, we've introduced to you this alternative way of progressing, haven't we? Which is, if we rub that part of it out, and we put in place the alternate way, which is we have God, who, by the way, has masculine and feminine qualities, which we, you were taught right from the beginning, remember, and, but exists without, outside of the universe. The reason why we know that to be a fact is because God existed before the universe came into being. So as a result... God exists outside of the universe. Now, God can enter the universe through certain mechanisms and energies, but God is a separate entity than the universe itself, which God created. Right? So God exists there, let's say, outside the universe, and this is the universe. And by this universe, I'm not only referring to the physical universe in which we live, which... Um, scientists feel do have a boundary and it's expanding at the moment and it, and it actually, they've found recently, very recently in fact, that it actually flows, that it's actually rotating around what seems to be cause and there is also a flow from universal structures into other universal structures. They've also found, scientists have found, which is also a truth, that there is a large amount of matter in the universe that they cannot see. But it has a weight, it has a gravitational field and so forth. So this is proof, these are proofs that there are other dimensional spaces. And so mathematicians have come up and, made, and, and got supercomputers on the job. And, and they've found that there's 13 or 14 math, uh, dimensional spaces that they can prove through mathematics at this point in time. Right? So, and I'm saying, when I'm talking about the universe, I'm talking about all of that. All of these dimensional spaces. And by the way, dimensional spaces keep on being created. Not by God, but actually by the people who enter these new spaces through conditions of love. But that's a separate subject altogether. So here we have is, we've got this universal structure in which we, a human person, a human soul exists, of which we personally are one half. Now... We have the ability to communicate with the source of our creation. God, let's call God the source or creator. God is an entity, as you'll find out through your process. But, but don't assume that. Like, experiment with that. 
Does that make sense? We can experiment with everything about God. However, what God is offering to us, and which is what we're talking about here, the divine love, is that God's offering us that God's love, which is a part of the substance of God, can enter our soul can actually physically enter this part of us. Not, not these bodies, but the soul itself, our real self. Not the bodies. It's very important that we understand it's not the bodies. It's the soul through, that is in communication with God. And so it's very important for us, as you can see from that, that, that we connect to our own soul that we actually know what our own soul is and can feel the emotions and passions and desires and personality and nature of, our, of ourselves. A very important part of this process. Now, God's offering us this love, and this love is offered since our coming in the first century. It's been offered since then to all humanity, no matter what religion you are, no matter what you know, nation you are, as the Bible says, tribe, nation, tongue. No, what, it doesn't matter whether what gender you are, how old you are, any of those things. It's being offered to you as a gift. But the will of the soul itself must be engaged in receiving the gift. Right? Now, you've all been taught these basic principles, right? Now, when we have... A certain thing happening inside of our soul, this gift of love, divine love, can flow from God's soul, who is outside of the universe, through the universe, and into your soul. Right? And all it requires inside of you is a longing, a sincere, pure longing for it. That's all it requires. Nothing else. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, if you had to be perfect before it happened, it'd probably never happen. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have a whole lot of rules and laws that you follow. But there are some basic principles. But you don't have to have a whole lot of rules and laws to follow in order to receive this love. There's only one thing you need. And that is a sincere, pure longing for it. That's it. Nothing else. Right? Now many of us go, but, but, but what about all the stuff you're taught about truth and then what else? All that? Yeah, all that's just side stuff. Trying to help you <laughs> through a process that you've been unwilling to engage, right? This is the process that a child can engage. And trust me, there are many children who, of people who have listened to us in audiences who are doing far better with this than we are as adults <laughs> who are receiving divine love, right? And because they, they trust the process much more generally. So this love enters the soul. But what opens the soul itself to receive the love? And the answer to that is prayer. Prayer has the effect of opening the soul so that some love can come in. So a lot of times, when you develop a longing for something, you are now open to its reception. Does that make sense? Now, many of you want to have people give you things without you being open to its reception. So you, you look in a relationship, in a general relationship, many people... Um, want the other party to give them love while they are completely closed to receiving the love. Right? The only way love flows is for the person who wants to receive it to open their heart to the reception of it. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? Like, if you've got a door closed to the reception of love, how is love, no matter how much love is given to you, how much can it enter you? None. Unless you open the door and let the love in, no love can enter you. That's the use of your will. That's the ultimate decision that you need to make for yourself. The ultimate decision is, do I want to open my soul to receive love from the source, from the creator? That's my ultimate choice, my ultimate decision. And God will leave that decision with you. So if you don't want to make that decision for thousands of years, well, that's okay with God. That's your choice. That's the free will gift that God gave you to make that choice. But when you pray, 
When you have a longing, and remember prayer is a longing, a sincere, passionate, desirous longing for this love to enter you, when you open your heart, it will enter you. It will enter you every time you have a sincere longing for it. Every time. So if you think you're praying and you're not receiving this love, then you haven't got a sincere longing for it. Because God always answers the soul with a sincere longing. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Well, and it's worth um, growing the discernment internally between what is a sincere longing and what is not. If you're telling yourself you're asking and you're not receiving, then you can go, I, I learned something here about what real there's longing... There's my experiment. Yeah. And there's this a straight is... uh, result straight <laughs> yeah, away. Yeah, results. <laughs> this thing that I'm feeling, that's not longing. Okay. Keep looking, you know, what is this thing I'm feeling? What does a longing feel like? Many of us have yet to discover that. Because if we had discovered that, we would already be receiving love every time we longed for it. I was, um, you said something to me last year about longing, like, which made the light bulb go off in my head. Yeah. It was... Um, it was along the lines that I said all I was doing was I had a goal and then I had faith that I was going to get there. And you said that's what longing is, like in a simple sort of way. Um, yep. I was wondering if you could just probably elaborate on how simple it is, because like, I feel that it is that simple. Yeah, probably the best way to elaborate on it would be, you know when you first see somebody that you really like and you would like to have a relationship with them, right? I really like you and I'd like to have a relationship with you. Right? Um, and let's say you see them from over the other side of the room. All right? Now, you, there's something that starts inside of you, isn't there? There's, if you think about the kind of emotions, it's very interesting because they're very similar to the kind of emotions we described yesterday when we're talking about love again. You get a bit of a joy in your heart when you look at that person. You feel a bit excited. Does that not the case? And then, and then what happens is that you allow this excitement and, and feeling to grow, don't you? You don't, you don't shut it down. You allow it to grow and, you go, and it grows big enough for you to make the approach. Right? And, <laughs> and to go towards them, right? And then when she's doing that, you go, a bit of fear might come up. Maybe she's not interested or whatever. But then if the, if the desire is really there, the longing is really there, you'll even overcome that, won't you? And if the longing's strong enough, she could say, I'm not interested in you, and you say, ah, oh, you'll be interested in me soon. <laughs> <laughs> right? and, and there's that feeling that, that pulls you to it, and you allow that feeling to develop. You don't shut it down. Right? Now, that's really the kind of feeling that we need to start developing with God. Now, the problem with God is we can't see God in the sense of an outward shape. We, we can't interact with the physical, whereas with the person we can. So part of our problem with God is because we can't see God, we then, we don't, we then don't think that we can establish a relationship. But the reality is we can establish a relationship soul to soul. And once we start connecting to our soul, instead of seeing the outward beautiful appearance of the person... We, we start connecting to their soul rather than their appearance. Now, we can do the same thing with God. We want to connect with the beautiful person or being that God is in the same way. We can develop this kind of longing. So my suggestion is to let yourself think about, if you, if you feel that you don't have a longing for God, let yourself think about the longing you've had in the past or currently for a person in a relationship and how that feels. So that you can sort of imagine the feeling that you might finish up having with God. Now, it won't be a sexual feeling with God, because God created the two halves to be sexually connected. Right? It will be a bigger feeling, in fact, than the sexual feeling with God. But, but it's going to start with very small, in very small, in very small steps, usually, initially. All right? So once we have this feeling, this feeling of wanting to know God... The feeling of wanting to discover God, wanting to feel some of God's love. And in fact, the more of God's love we feel, the more we'll want to know about God, actually. 
Right? And, if, and allow that feeling to develop. And that's what a prayer is. A prayer is not an intellectual thought aimed towards God. It is a feeling felt for God. Very, very different. Does that make sense? Yeah. And there's, as um, Fab rightly pointed out, there's faith. Faith in actually connecting to God. Yeah. 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 Yeah, if, if you just hand it back to Vafra, is that? I thought that was um, the one that connected it all. It was like the faith that it could actually be the love there for you. Like, yes. Like you walking up to the other woman, the faith that the potentialities of that person could love you back. Exactly. So if you, in this relationship, if you saw the woman, and in my case, I'm a man, so I'm going for Mary, my soulmate, and there's a woman, and, and, and I, I saw her and I, and I went and I thought, yeah, I'd really love to have a relationship with her. And I'd really love to get to know her, really. That's really what we're saying, isn't it? We'd love to get to know the person. And to get to know them, I've got to eventually get to the point of speaking to them and sharing feelings with them, right? So eventually, I've got to have some kind of interaction. So that pulls me closer and closer to the interaction. Now, at some point, if she gave me a dirty look... <laughs> Try hard on that She's one. not very good at no. dirty looks anymore. And I used to be. She used to be real good at them, though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And, uh, one look could level a man. One oh, yeah. look. Is, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but if I got that dirty look and I, and, I, and I thought, and all of a sudden the fear comes up, uh, I don't know if I want a relationship with this woman. <laughs> right? Now, from that moment on, my desire has been pushed down, hasn't it? Has been squelched, if you like. It's been squelched and pushed down. And so there's a high likelihood I would not engage her. And therefore, would never know her. Right? But, but if you had, if you had a, a, the goal was to eventually be with Mary, that would still not allow, like, it'll still push through that, wouldn't it? Well, this is what I'm saying with God, though, most of the time. If we had true faith that God is good, and we had true faith that God had love to give you, and true faith that God wasn't give you, it going to give you a dirty look, right? Then, then it's highly unlikely you would stop. But unfortunately, because of our own emotional condition, we, we start entering this relationship with God and we start getting triggered by what we think about ourselves most of the time. All right? So we start thinking, oh, I'm not good enough to connect to God or I'm not this and that. And this is, whole religions have been created from those feelings. But where do you think the, the, all of the religions that believe in sacrifice, where do you think they got that teaching from? That you're not worthy where they, or that you're a sinner through to the core and you never got it, you, you know, you have to have somebody else come and save you. Where do you think those teachings came from? They came from this underlying feeling that's in most people that they're unworthy to connect to God. And so then they had to even create a religion based around the whole concept that you're unworthy. Mm -hmm. right? Now, the true Christian faith, which we established in the first century, is not based around the concept you're unworthy. <laughs> it's based around the concept you are worthy, the opposite concept. The concept that you are the pinnacle of God's creation. All right? But you may not believe this when you start with your relationship with God. And so what you do is once you start, you may start receiving some divine love and then feel not worthy. And this is where you have to be humble. You need to go, okay, I'm willing to feel this feeling knowing and having faith that it's only a feeling. It's not the truth about how God feels about me. It's only a feeling that I have about myself. Right? That needs to be go, that needs to be released, right? Can I just add one side note? Uh, based on that uh, AJ approaching me and me giving him a dirty look. And <laughs> um, which is not that far from the truth. <laughs> but, and it's something for those of you who are in a partnership or who want to be. One of the most beautiful things that my relationship with AJ has taught me about not just him, but about love and God, is that when I threw at him anger and dirty looks and things, he had faith that that was just injury and that underneath I was created beautiful. And that made him very patient and kind and loving with me. Um, and that is a beautiful thing if you think about it that you can offer to a partner, that not having expectations on them but also seeing that what, if they're throwing at you things that are hurtful or hard, you don't have to accept them, but you can also know and affirm to them that they, that's, not, that's part of their creation and not God's. 
So myself and Mary have had many conversations where I've said to Mary, but this isn't you. Like this feeling you have of anger towards me or anger towards men generally or whatever, that's not you. That's not how God created you. That's just something that's entered you. It's, it's not really a part of you. You can have it leave you too. Right? And this is one of the things we need to have some faith in, that we can have our, have our bad feelings leave us. We don't have to retain them. Yeah. And as you do that, you <laughs> offer your partner something that demonstrates what God offers us, which is very helpful then when you go to engage your relationship with God. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So that was